Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the Lit RPG Podcast. I'm Ramon Mejia, here to bring you the latest Lit RPG news, reviews, and of course, author interviews. This week I have four new reviews for you folks. That's going to include Dunger Carl, Dunger Crawler Carl, written by Matt Dinman. We also are going to have a Cookmancer Online. After that, will be the Ozzy Mana Apocalypse, a Lit RPG story. And last but not least, um, I'm going to say the English version of this. <laughs> it's, it seems the strongest job is not Hero nor Sage, but Inspector Provisional instead. Long title. I'll get into it later. Uh, before we start into any of those things, we're, gonna, of course, going to go into Lit RPG News. <laughs> And this week, we're going to start off with just a quick review of some of the plagiarized stories we found in the Litter PD section on Amazon this week. Uh, again, these are stories that have been ripped off from online sources, including abandoned stories on the rural road or on web novels. Um, and people are literally just copying, pasting them in chapters, posting them on Amazon as their own, and trying to rake in the money before they get caught or before somebody tries to take their novels down or the, the novel down. Um, we, as a podcast, always notify the original authors. Um, as best we can um, from the original sources. Uh, but sometimes these stories are just abandoned and the author hasn't gone back to that site in potentially years. And so it can be a little, little challenging. So for me, for my part, I always try to leave a review on Amazon, letting readers know that this is a stolen story, that it's plagiarized. Uh, please don't give money to the plagiarizer. So there you go. What you choose to do is up to you as well, but that's the best that I can do to make it unprofitable. Uh, and this week we have a couple here, including the uh, Game Changer. Actually, this week is a little weird because um, these are obviously plagiarized stories. Um, they're The first two are from abandoned stories on the railroad um, from like three, four years, unfortunately. Um, so the authors may never actually get the message we sent them. Um, and the plagiarized versions are actually claiming to be the same author name um but you can tell that it is plagiarized because one the artwork is stolen uh the cover art is stolen both of these stories are completely unfinished as in they continue the story for about you know four or five chapters or sometimes 10 or 15 um and then they just stop and the authors have said like oh i'm not continuing this story i'm going to be banning it um so you know the author has no intention of actually publishing in the first place um but in addition to that you can actually look at the two cover arts if you look at the video version of the podcast between the first two, the cover art um, text, uh, textile is completely the same. Um, and the inside cover art, you can actually see the same copy and pasted um, information about, about the story. So, um, And there were again slight changes like, oh, the character's main character's name or something. So the little things like that. Uh, the first story we're talking about is Game Changer. It's an abandoned story from Royal Road that has been copy and pasted. Uh, and again, in this case, the plagiarizer is actually claiming to be the author, which makes it... Um, Super bold, super bold. Next one is also called The False Summoned. Um, it's from Abandoned War World Story, again, of the same name. Um, the plagiarized version is claiming to be the author, but not the case. Uh, again, stolen artwork, exact same style of, of text and typography as the previous one. Again, also stolen cover art um, from DeviantArt. Um, so there you go. And the third one is look like it's from a different group, but again, I've seen the exact same style of artwork, um, stolen cover art um, from, from DeviantArt, um, same kind of typography on all these stolen productions. And in this case, the author's name is actually different in this case. And again, there are slight changes in the story and like the main character's name or the particular name of the game, but everything else is, is very much copy and paste. Um, and this one is stolen from um, web novel. The cop plagiarized version is called Overleveled, two words, and the original version is called Overleveled one word. So again, there are these weird kind of things that go on here. Um, okay. Uh, those are the one, two, three I have this week. There are a few other actually uh, ones I found in the cultivation section of, of Amazon. Just happened to come across them from like links, uh, to these particular titles. And I left, um, uh, one star review saying these are plagiarized and I notified the original, uh, art, uh, owners of the stories and they've written back saying, thanks for letting us know. Okay, on the stuff that is out now, we have, um, these are stories that have come recently, I haven't had a chance to read them, but they are out for you to enjoy, including the second book in the Tycoon series called Trudging the Path to a Modest Life in a Fantasy World, book two in the series, Zero Hero book two is out, 
um, as is a story called The Great MacGuffin. Um, the fourth book in the God's Game series called Sovereign is out for you to enjoy. The seventh book in the Legends Online series is out. And this one actually looks interesting. I've read the first one. I really enjoyed it. I gave it a good review. A lot of people enjoyed it. Called Guardians Pal Tree Planet, book number two. You might not actually recognize this series. Um, the first book was called Giant Lands, um, and it has a different um, main character on the cover. Um, so just, just be aware that this is an enjoyable story. And if you recognize the term giant lands, that's a uh, probably more familiar series <laughs> title than the uh, pal tree planet. So there you go. Um, also that is the second book in the bio dungeon series called the bodies dungeon. Um, this one is a co-authored production from Jeffrey Fogg and Logue and John the Brooks are two, uh, dungeon core novel authors. And they've combined their talents to create a, a story that has a dungeon set as uh, in a person's body. Uh, so it's an interesting series. Lots of little nice fun technical details about how the body works. Uh, viruses versus bacteria. Different things that the, <laughs> uh, the core has to defend against. So interesting stuff. Um, also out is the fifth book in the Noah Ter- Nova Terra series. Um, so for you to enjoy. And the second book in the Vanquire the Dragon series. I actually never read this one myself. Our correspondent Ian Mitchell read and reviewed the first book in the series. He enjoyed it. He liked it. It's a little bit for him. So um, book two is out for you to enjoy. And hopefully he'll, he'll give us another review. Um, and also out is Twilight of Midgard, a Liberty fantasy series. So there we go. And that's the stuff that's out now onto new audiobooks, which is a lot more exciting for some audio files. We have Hive Knight is out as an audiobook. Also, the fifth book in the Dragonheart series is out as an audiobook. The Bright Blade book is out as an audiobook for you. Um, also, out the third book in the Light Online series. Uh, the story, the Russian translation story called A Cat and His Human League of Losers is out. And again, I will warn you that it, even the cover art is very much uh, very cutesy anime looking. The story is not as much. It's definitely not as lighthearted as the cover art makes it look. It is more of a mature, darker RPG apocalypse kind of story. Um, also out is the seventh book. In the Stonehaven League series, a very popular series written by Carrie Summers, voiced by the Samba Theater crew, um, called Echoes of the System. So go enjoy all those great audiobooks and upcoming Liberty Deeds. Just where I read a bunch of stuff that's coming out in the near future. All the stuff I found on Prude or on Amazon, put it together for you. So, guys, so you guys don't have to look. You can plan out your purchasing schedule. You can plan out your release schedule if you're an author sometimes this is very useful um october the third is going to be awaken online the third book in the tarot in the side series tarot series um on october the 5th it'll be undertaker monster of galaxy book number one by austin black it'll be october the 6th the third book in the life in exile series also on the 6th of october it'll be the fifth book in the monster maces and magic series october the 7th it'll be city of goblins in the system so there you go. We also have the second book in the League of Le- Kings League book, rather, um, out on October the 13th. The fifth book in the Bad Guys series, again, this uh, is uh, coming out on October 22nd. This is actually going to move from the beginning of October to the end of October due to um, circumstances in the author's life. So it's a very reasonable uh, set of circumstances. So don't get mad at him. It's just life forced him to change the real estate. Um, on October 26th, it'll be the fourth book in the Underdog series. October 27th, the third book in the Eternal Online series. On November the 3rd, the Master of Metal will come out. And November the 10th, it'll be the third book in the Heavenly Throne series. November the 10th, it'll be Monster Maces and Magic Book 6. On November the 10th, the fourth book in the Alchemist series by uh, Vasily Mahenko. On November 23rd, the second book in the Reborn Online series. November 23rd as well, Biomedical Self-Engineering series. December the 1st, the Twilight Hatchling. On December the 3rd, it'll be the second book in the League of Losers series. December the 10th, the Product Stellar book number three. December the 14th, the new series called The Keepers of Limbo, uh, another Russian translation. It'll be December the 15th will be the Underhair Chronicles book number two. And December the 16th, Interworld Network Champ- uh, Internetwork book number three, The Dark Champion. December 28th, it'll be Small Unit Tactics volume two. And last but not least, December 31st, last day of the year, uh, the fifth book in the Arkemi Online Chronicle series. So there you go. Five, uh, all those nice books for you two guys to, to read and plan your schedule. Um, so there you go. If you're an author and you have something coming up in 
it's actually a little bit you'd be surprised how often <laughs> I get stuff requests um, that aren't, um, you know, let us know about it. We'll put it in our upcoming list so people can know it's coming out. And you can reach us at feedback at geekbypodcast.com or at uh, litrpgpodcast at gmail.com. Both great places to get us or, you know, send us a message on Facebook for the Lit RPG Podcast Facebook page. Okay, on to new releases and reviews. Okay, first up this week is going to be Dungeon Crawler Carl, a lit RPG game lit adventure written by Matt Denneman. It is... 446 pages, $3.99. It is not available on Kindle Unlimited as the um, as of the recording of this particular podcast. Uh, here's the author's description. The apocalypse will be televised. A man, his ex-girlfriend's caddy, said it's a game show unlike anything in the universe. A dungeon crawl where survival depends on killing your prey in the most entertaining way possible. In a flash... Every human erected construction on Earth, from the Buckingham Palace to the tiniest of sheds, collapses into a heap, sinking into the ground. The buildings and all the people inside have been atomized and transformed into the dungeon. An 18-level labyrinth filled with traps, monsters, and loot. A dungeon so enormous it circles the entire globe. Only a few dare venture inside, but once in it, you can't get out. And what's worse, each level has a time limit. You have but days to find a staircase to the next level down. Or it's game over. In this game, it's not about your strength or your dexterity. It's about your followers, your views, your clout. It's about building an audience and killing those goblins with style. You can't just survive here. You gotta survive big. You gotta fight with vigor and excitement. You gotta make them stand up and cheer. And if you don't do have that it factor, you may just find yourself with the following. That's the only way to truly survive this game with the help of the loot boxes dropped upon you by generous benefactors watching from across the galaxy. They call it Dunger Crawler World, but for Carl, it's anything but a game. Okay, that's kind of a long introduction. Um, but it's all it's all very true. It's just a little wordy. Um, full disclosure, I received a copy review. I purchased a copy for I purchased a copy when it became available. Um, this is another kind of odd, quirky, but highly entertaining story from the author, Matt Denneman, author of uh, several series, which I'm sure you've enjoyed. Um, this time, the Earth is turned into a dungeon with only a fraction of the population surviving in the initial transformation. And again, as the novel description said, the survivors must dungeon dive while being watched by an intergalactic audience. Then your brother Carl and his cat companion, Princess Donut, the Queen and Chunk, that's really what she's called, uh, must survive the monsters and other players and find a way to entertain the audience to get sponsors, which means made the difference between life and death. Uh, the story takes place in a twisted version of the Hunger Games mixed with a dungeon crawl. There's all manner of weird monsters and a social aspect that adds a nice twist to this. I actually think this, the audience section of this was better developed um, then in a lot of stories, they've tried it out mostly because the author takes the time to do these little cutaway scenes where their main character and his cat, um, uh, princess donut, um, go on these little talk shows and they talk to the alien viewers or they talk to kind of this almost, um, overstyle chat show, uh, format. And it, it gives you, um, an insight into who the audience actually is, what they're entertained by and little clues here and there about what um, it's going to take for the characters to survive this kind of, again, hunger, hunger, hunger game style situation where they can get these special loot boxes from uh, benefactors or sponsors that may or may not help them to survive more. Um, and I, I thought it was actually very well developed and adds a little nice little break in the story from just like straight dungeon crawl the entire time. Um, the plotting in the story is very slice of life. This is not um, a super like, oh, nobody's out to save the world. Nobody's looking for a mystery here in this universe. There's no AI trying to, you know, break free of the game masters or anything. This is really simply a dungeon crawl um, with some social aspects. But, but the big focus for the main character is just surviving, getting through the level figuring out the rules, how to use them and how to use the, the, the viewers, uh, in a way to, to, to increase him and his cat companion's survival. Because as the dungeon go, as you go deeper in the dungeon, there are fewer and fewer, uh, exits to the next level, which means more and more of these people have to die, uh, to, 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 you know, to, to, for people to 
continue on, uh, eventually kind of amounting in, at the very lowest level with one or two people who, whatever groups are, surviving and be, being declared champions. Um, so eventually there's going to be, you can tell there's going to be a setup for like these huge player versus player like issues. Uh, but for in this particular story, it's more about the player versus the environment. And then of course, lots of tons of people die left and right. It's, it's a little dark and gory in places. Um, but again, on the, on the whole, it's just very slice of life on the main character as it goes through these situations. And, but it's very entertaining, at least, at least for me. Uh, and there is a little bit of cliffhanger towards the end. Um, but it kind of felt like, oh, this is a serial story written online, which it is, um, that just kind of pauses. This is a nice place to pause as the continue has more written. Um, and at the end of the book, the author does say he has a second book already written. It's an editing and it'll be published at some point in the future, but you can also find this online, which is why it may not be available on Kindle but currently. Um, the actual game mechanics in the story are very familiar. Lots of regular. There's an intricate part of the storyline. Um, notifications, items, spell descriptions, all that stuff is there. There is, There are levels and there are stats in the story, but they take a little bit of vaccine in this first book just because of the way that the game is set up and that the main character cannot um, distribute his free stat points until he gets to a certain level uh, in the game. Um, and so that's just taking that a little bit of backseat until he gets to class, until he gets a potential race chain, until he gets a bunch of other stuff in the story. Um, and I actually like the fact that the author is leaving things in for future stories um, to develop these game mechanics, to, to kind of change the way the game is potentially played. Um, and saving you know, a little bit of special stuff for, for future books. Um, for me, I found it a very entertaining story. I've liked most of the stuff the author's written. I like all the stuff he's written in the literary genre specifically. And I, I like the fact that he took this trope of a dungeon crawl and kind of made with, with his, you know, quirky writing style with his very um, inventive and imaginative characters and monsters makes it an interesting story. It adds a little bit of gruesomeness, which is a trademark for some of his other stories. Um, not, not over the top necessarily. It's not ne <laughs> nearly as bad as, um, the Kaiju battlefield search. If you read that one, that one's super gruesome, not nearly as, as much as that. Um, not as light or, or gruesome free as, you know, Dominion of Blades, but still something in the middle. Um, but so very interesting, good characters, lots of funny humor here as well. For me, it gets a score of 7.9 out of 10, almost an eight, almost a great story. Um, things that kind of stop her from just hitting that mark for me is that, it's a, it, it's fundamentally a dungeon crawl. It is fundamentally a slice of life story, um, and it's not as innovative as necessarily, you know, battle kaiju battlefield surgeon necessarily. So for me, there's just like a tiny step down of as far as like entertainment goes because you could see some of the things plotted out, and you can see it, it's very much a slice of life story, um, and so it's just kind of a, an entertaining ride, um, but still very. Very good story. Definitely recommend that you read it. That's Dungeon Crawler Carl, a little bit of game of adventure with a score of 7.9 out of 10. Okay, next up is Cook Mancer Online, a little bit of game lit novel, VR verse book number one, written by Nera Vivaldi. It is 266 pages, $3.99. It's available on Kindle Unlimited. And here's the author's description The goal is simple level up and earn enough points to pay for my mother's medical needs. I'm Keela, and I want to soar through the air and command the wind as a feared and respected aeromancer in an online gothic fantasy world. I've collected what experience we needed, but someone decided victory shouldn't be mine. I got hacked, and they used my points to build uh, on a, on a use on a build used for mule accounts. Now, apparently, I cook. I do magic with my food, but not by choice. Not only do I have to deal with that, but I have to survive a world filled with the undead, vampires, and a group of people who think I should suffer some more. With the help of my friends, a flesh golem, fairy illusionist, and a shapeshifter, we put a plan into place to prove to my enemies I can win and help my mom with flower power. Um, there you go. Sorry. That's, that's the story. Um, fundamentally, I didn't like this story, though. Um, it's not badly written, um, but I never connected to the main character. And I kind of didn't like her at the beginning. Um, I didn't actually, I came to kind of enjoy her, her character arc a little better as the story progresses. Um, but the beginning of the story kind of puts the main character in, 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 a, in, a, in a victim role in the story, which just didn't feel right um, to how she was acting, how she behaved, and 
the much stronger personality, I think, that the main character had. And, and it's developed as the story continues on. But and that, while from a writing standpoint and storytelling standpoint, I understand that the author is giving the main character these hardships. It just it's just the way it was developed. Um, it, it it felt abrasive. No abrasive. It just it didn't work for me. I, I don't want to spoil how it didn't work for me. And I understand that the author is also trying to convey things about um, a culture issue that is very much true. Um, but fundamentally, the, the beginning of the story was uh, it just it just didn't didn't work for me. So there you go. And that's probably okay. It will connect with other readers, which is perfectly fine. But for me, the story in the whole didn't work. Um, and part of the issue was the fact that the story is set in a far flung universe, far flung future, where humanity is saved from environmental catastrophe and from social destruction by an AI, an artificial intelligence that works for governments to preserve and better humanity. Like this AI is supposed to be incorporated into all aspects of life, so much so that all housing woes and all food woes and issues have been solved. People don't survive anymore. People don't have housing issues. Um, and people can actually work and do things to please the AI or to, to further um, quests given by the uh, the artificial intelligence and get social credits so that they can then use to do uh, purchase um, bonuses that the AI has of like super advanced medical procedures, uh, which is kind of the fundamental like hook for the story and the, why the main character is in this game world trying to get these social credits by playing in the game, completing quests, and also doing social quests in real life, which is kind of a, an interesting twist there. And that uh, uh, by doing these things, the main character is supposed to be collecting these social credits, which she can then use to get her mother artificial, newly regrown eyes. She, her mom currently has artificial eyes, but they're not like best, um, which is a perfectly fine premise. Um, but for me, all those things sound so interesting. They really did, but they weren't developed. Um, as far as like uh, an explanation of why they occur or, or going into any real depth about this futuristic world that is existing. And I thought it was such a missed opportunity because had that existed, I probably would have connected to the story better, but it wasn't. So for me, it kind of felt like um, the story was floating on on this on this kind of like very... I want to say, what's the word? Uh, surface level material of, of of the story world, and also that translated very much into the game world. That was the same case. The game mechanic world, the 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 game world was also very superficial as far as like the explanations of how the game mechanics worked. Um, there was no real numbers thrown around. They're all it's all it's all very much. Oh, I cast this thing and it did a thing without any like real like explanation of costs. Uh, for stamina, man, mana points, whatever the case is, or or, or, or very vague damage numbers, um, and and that was just a lack of depth in the story and the storytelling, and the world building was kind of the thing that made me like, oh, this probably could have been pretty, pretty could have been good with a little more depth of the of these elements, and that's definitely a writing decision. I don't. Uh, um, that's the author's choice. It just meant that I didn't connect with the story or the main character or, or her plight um, in this instance. Um, so now on the subject of the game mechanics, there, the, the, again, the depth is doesn't exist. Uh, there are lots of notifications. Uh, a lot of the story exists in, in the game. Not all of it. But a good portion of it still exists outside of the game, which was kind of an issue for me because it didn't really... Um, that's a side point though. Um, as far as the game mechanics though, they exist. It's, it's set in this MMO game universe. Um, and you can tell the, the author ha probably has some uh, experience being a gamer, which is fine. Um, but again, there, there's kind of a lack of depth in the explanation for, for the game mechanics and also balance for them. Um, and also as the title of, of a cook answer, I kind of thought there was going to be more cooking and it ended up being that the main character summons, um, summons ingredients. Um, at will, uh, any kind of ingredients, even though she's never maybe come across them in real life. Um, she can kind of summon whatever she wants to, and it, it ends up being a tool where she drops them on somebody um, to give them a debuff or to have some interesting um, effect, like dropping powder on somebody to kind of show that they're invisible or something like that. Um, and while I, I definitely see the 
an interesting application of those those those, those aspects. It's like, oh, that is that's kind of superficial, and there's no real cost again to to those actions necessarily. So the, it costs just as much for to summon, you know, a jar of honey as, as it would be a giant bag of flour potentially, or it's actually the, there's no cost given, which is an issue for me. Uh, but again, so the game mechanics are just not in depth, which was an issue for me as for my drumming goes. Overall, novel didn't work for me. Um, just didn't really satisfy the Little BGH. Um, I, I actively disliked the beginning again. Um, and while the eventual storyline development, especially again, was satisfying enough that it kind of mitigated some of that, it was definitely an upper battle for me to read. Um, and I gotta say, the story kind of feels like it's a potentially a right to market attempt from somebody who's used to writing another kind of novel. There's really well developed emotional stakes. And again, I. This is kind of what bugs me that the emotional side of this was definitely better developed. Like, there's definitely a depth to what the main character feels and the expression of that and her, her, um, what her issue is with her, you know, jerky boyfriend and his sleaziness and his his bad behavior and how she's trying to help her mother and their conversations. You can definitely feel the emotional development there, which is kind of nice, but that same depth isn't carried into the real building. It's not carried into the game mechanics, which is especially disappointing for somebody who loves game mechanics and a lit RPG story. Um, so for me, those just made it a less entertaining for me so much so that I give it a six out of 10, which means not that it's a bad story necessarily. It just doesn't work for me. I had issues with it, which I've stated about, uh, if you may like this more, um, I couldn't get around those issues, unfortunately. So for me, I didn't enjoy this. Uh, that's Cook Mancer Online with a score of 6 out of 10. Okay, next up is going to be the Aussie Mana Apocalypse, a literary novel written by C.J. Tim. So it is 135 pages, $2.99. It's available on Kindle Limited. And here's the author's description. A game lit western set in the Australian Outback. At the end of their gap years, Keat Walker and his mates repeat their camping trip to Broken Hill. Repeating their schoolies trip seemed like the perfect chance to have a yarn about their adventures over the last year. Then the apocalypse happened. So you know what? This Just the way this reads, I almost feel like I have to read it in an accent. So I'm going to do one paragraph that way. And the author can totally yell at me for not having a good accent. But it feels like it would be kind of entertaining to do so. So the second paragraph of the novel description Mountain infused into the world overnight. Oh, that's terrible. Okay. And a country already contain containing the world's 10 most poisonous snakes, crocodiles, and sharks is overrun with monsters. Dungeons spring up, boss mobs roam the landscape, and there isn't a wiki to be found. Okay, not terrible, but I'll continue the rest of normal. Uh, facing the Australian outback, Keats and his best mate Nugget, Nugget's sister Mel, who he definitely did not have a thing with. Um, Mel's new boyfriend from Aunt Melbourne and a British backpacker. Armed with only a barbecue fork he made in his woodshop, his new class of jackaroo, and the potential to tame the monsters now roaming the outback, Keat must find a way to towards Broken Hill. Okay. Um, now, <laughs> full disclosure, um, this is just a fun story. Um, so any criticisms that I have it are, are basically from, I, there are small little things that probably could have made it like almost great to some extent, at least like would have got a better score. So the, 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 the small things I'm going to talk about didn't really take away necessarily from the overall enjoyment, but it made, um, portions of it a little challenging to like get into initially, especially in the beginning, which is like the, the, the part that's initially selling a story. Um, so just take that with a grain of salt. Um, this is a slice of life RPG apocalypse story set in Australia. It has a very regional start, uh, which may be an issue for some readers, but once it gets to the RPG apocalypse stuff, it shines with good humor and fun adventures. Um, so here are the storytelling issues. Um, the biggest one is, is probably, well, not the biggest the one issue is that it takes a little bit too long to get to the RPG apocalypse. Probably it takes about 10%, which is not necessarily unusual. But that first 10% probably does a lot of stuff that isn't necessary in the story. So it feels a little bit longer and clunkier than it needs to. The, that first 10% is used to develop backgrounds to the main characters, uh, references places and events, and establishes relationships with characters. And while the established relationships between characters thing is important, um, all the references to specific locations um, and events in the story probably could have been cut out or just like sprinkled 
after the apocalypse charted uh, to, to, to show their relations a little bit more um, instead of just being in this kind of info dumpy first section. Um, and that's mostly because a lot of the places <laughs> mentioned are places I have no idea what they are. This is written about a, a country I've never lived in. And while regionally readers in Australia are probably like, oh, I know that place, I know that place, I know the reference, great, great. And it, it'll help them uh, connect with Australia a little better as somebody who's never been to Australia, who doesn't know the places you're mentioning. They were just, it was just kind of distracting. It was like, Oh, name, there's a proper name there. I have no idea what it means, but it feels like in the context of the story that it's probably important, but I'm not getting it. So I'm not connecting with the story. Um, or, or ge geographical references without actually describing what those things are. Like it, it felt like it, in that section, the first 10%, um, it, it's assumed that I know what he's talking about. Um, so there's no explanation given, especially when it came to use of um, regional words um, or, or just slang that that's very Australian. And Australian's like, oh, I know exactly what he means. Aha, that's funny. And I'm like, I felt like I was being left out of a good joke. And I, in the context, I was like, I'm pretty sure this is supposed to be funny, but I don't know what those words mean. Uh, so I feel disconnected from this. And it just kind of made the, the beginning portion of the story slightly less accessible to anybody who's not Australian. Um, and that is unfortunate because um, all those issues with that kind of disappear once you get to the RPG Apocalypse section because that story shrinks. It shrinks to just like this small location. And because all the geography changes, um, because of the RPG Apocalypse stuff, um, you know, monsters grow big, plants grow big, the topography of, of the area changes. Um, all those proper now, all those properly worded places and and and, and references and, and distances from this place to this place or this, you know, he says, doesn't matter anymore because it, it, it literally doesn't exist in, the, in that way anymore. Um, and so had that first section kind of been trimmed out a little bit or just edited, it. So either local slang was, was kind of just, or, um, uh, defined a little bit more or, uh, trimmed a little bit. It, the, the beginning of the story would have, um, connected just a, a little bit more, a little more accessible to readers. Uh, but again, I, I, I only say this because. I think this this story could legitimately be great because the rest of it is really good. Um, but that beginning part did take a lot away from me. Um, the rest of the story, though, once you get to the RPG section, very funny. Um, very, very, like lots of great humor, lots of good action. The RPG apocalypse stuff is really well done. Um, and again, once you get to that section, very, very good. Um, and it shows that it's like an action oriented story, lots of humor. And I mean, just, just reading the novel description, you can tell that there's, there's a really nice sense. As long as it lands with you, you're probably going to be laughing when you read this. The main character, for instance, deliberately takes the, the class he's least suited to as a middle finger to the universe. And his soul bound weapon is a scaling barbecue fork. And I mean, it, it's, it, it really is funny. Just take my word for it. Go check it out. It's entertaining in that respect. Um, the game mechanics and story, mostly standard D&D &D stuff with some custom classes. Um, so you see stats, characters, level experience points. So the, it, this is very much intended to be a little bit of story. It's not just superficial uh, as far as like the intent of it. Um, I, I definitely could tell in the story that the game mechanics were some played um, put into second place as far as like actually relatable numbers um, just for the sake of fun. Uh, because sometimes the monster description would have health and mana point descriptions. Sometimes they wouldn't. Uh, and that was because of, of, of maybe the author just getting, focusing on the application of, of abilities and powers instead of worrying about numbers and making the numbers match up. And that's very much a concern in the genre of like, oh, if I get my numbers wrong, people are going to complain. So I'm just going to avoid my numbers uh, in some instances and and just kind of focus on, oh, these are legitimate effects of, of the powers that I'm giving these characters instead of necessarily uh, micromanage or uh, number crunching necessarily. And that's a balance that every every little bit other kind of has to make. Um, so I don't, I don't, you know, I, I may write differently personally, but I also understand the author is just kind of having a fun time writing the story as a, as, as a side gig. Um, I think it's some of the doc in the story, he's a, he's a doctor or something. So I'm like, oh, I get that. This is just kind of a fun side project, um, which is totally just fine. Um, 
So there you go. But again, the game mechanics are always really entertaining. Overall, it's a fun story again once you get to the actual RPG apocalypse. Um, so even if you are reading this and like, and you read the first 10%, you're like, I, I, I'm not really connecting. Like I would generally encourage you to push on past that 10% sample section of the novel and just, you know, another 5% and see if it still doesn't connect with you. Cause I, I'm, I'm pretty sure once you get to RPG Apocalypse, you're going to find a lot of stuff that's familiar and entertaining, um, and just kind of goofy and fun sometimes. And I really liked all that stuff about this. I'm giving this score 7.6 out of 10. Um, had it not had those issues, it probably would have got something a little bit higher, probably still in the seven range, just a little bit higher than the seven range. Um, but because those early issues that again, made it challenging to, to connect with it early on, um, I have to be fair about how I, how I felt about this and, and my notes. Uh, uh, about the story. Uh, so I'm giving the score a 7.6 out of 10, which is again, a, still a very good score. It's just not great, uh, which is perfectly acceptable. Um, so that's Ozzy Man and Apocalypse with a score of 7.6 out of 10. And last of this week is going to be it, uh, a story called uh, It Seems the Strongest Job is Not Hero Nor Sage, but Inspector Provisional instead. Uh, the actual, I have the actual, uh, I'm going to say, Japanese. I, I actually didn't check um, title and the storyline in the in the novel description and also the um, review as well. So you can look it up by that as uh, that original title. Um, it is twenty five chapters. It is a web comic, um, so it's 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 there. It is free um, uh, on the internet. Uh, there is no English publisher yet, so you can actually purchase as a manga in the original language or in other languages you want to support the author, uh, you can still purchase it. That's fine. But as far as an English translation or English publisher, uh, doesn't exist. So all this is fan translated. All this is it. You're literally scanning this in and taking the word bubbles and translating them. Uh, we'll get into that in a second though. Um, here's the novel description. It says an average student got some into another world and granted the strongest job. No, not hero, not sage either. It's inspector. This is just what it says, folks. Uh, with the ability to inspect anything and gather information accurately, surely this is the strongest job there is. So there you go. It's actually a very simple um, description of the manga. Um, and again, this is a scan and translated manga. Um, again, there is no official English publisher, fan translated, and so you're going to be actually reading this from um, right to left in the story whatever way you're looking at it. Um, so I was actually a little worried of this when I found it. Um, it's a transported to an RPG game world manga uh, with a slightly younger main character. Um, I wasn't sure if I was going to like the teen main character, but the story hits a lot of the slice of life beats that I really like. Um, it has plenty of RPG mechanics. It has a non overpowered main character. It's a tiny bit itchy. Um, so there's, there's, there's a couple bits where it's, you know, skin tight outfits. Um, it, it, the, they're in the early section of the story and you don't see them again until you don't actually see them again very much. Uh, so on the whole, not, 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 not the main focus of the story. Um, but there's also a very nice sense of humor here. Um, the art is black and white, but the lines are crisp and both action and humor are well conveyed. It is a slice slice story. So don't expect this huge complex save the world kind of hotline. It really is just the main character having a fun time with his companions, figuring out the rules of the world, how his particular, um, class as an inspector and his beginning ability sets is, uh, is going to kind of give him an edge or, or, or disadvantage sometimes in this world and how he's going to use it. Um, so you, I genuinely like the fact that it's an unusual class. Um, and it's not, it really isn't comet oriented. Um, so I like that fact as well. It gives it a nice little twist to be entertaining as a slice life story. Um, so, and, but the main character really just goes on adventures. He has fun. It's a very casual read, um, that you can kind of just relax and read, uh, for, for a couple of days or however long it takes to get through 25 long chapters. Um, so for me, it gets a score of 7.6 out of 10 entertaining little middle of the road as far as like on the good scale, not super good, not bad at all in any way, shape or form 7.6 out of 10. Uh, that's again, the, <laughs> I'm not going to say the long version. Um, it, that is some points extended for, it seems the strongest job is not hero nor sage, but inspector instead. So there we go. Uh, I enjoyed it. Okay, folks, that is it. The show is done. Thank you very much for listening, for watching, for taking the time to hang with me today and listen to me gab it and gab on and 
you know, about this genre that I love, Little RPG. Um, remember, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Patreon, and our website at LittleRPGPodcast.com. Um, we have plenty of places where you can follow us to see the podcast every single week. You can actually also just listen to us on your favorite podcast. I look for Lit RPG Podcast, and hopefully you can find us. We'll also have links in the show in, on our website um, where you can get the RSS feed for us. Okay, um, if you enjoy the show in any way, shape, or form, you can also find out ways to support us at litrpgpodcast.com slash support so you can keep us free and ad-free and free for everybody. Fun stuff there. But until we can hang out again, folks, um, thanks a lot for again taking the time to talk with me or listen to me talk. Um, and until we can hang out, remember to go read some lit RPG. Goodbye, everybody.